Our subject tonight is the creation mandate, and it's a vital topic. And uh, when I was a student, I totally misunderstood it. Um, I was pushing doors to see whether I could be a missionary or an evangelist, and those doors never opened, and I sort of concluded that I was on track B for the rest of my life, and I'd have to become a teacher. Uh, I didn't understand how I could serve God as a teacher and how wrong my theology was. Uh, well, hopefully we can all learn more tonight about this very important topic. And our speaker is Bill James, and uh, John and I have known Bill and his wife Sharon for many years, I don't know, maybe 30 years, I don't know, a long, long time. Um, Bill is principal of London Theological Seminary, or London Seminary, since January 2018, and before that, for 26 years, he was pastor of Emmanuel in Leamington Spa, and that's where I first met him. And uh, there's probably in that church more in engineers per square inch than any other <laughs> church in the United Kingdom. And you, you could be sitting next to somebody who was, uh, she was constantly checking her phone. And, uh, and I was asking, I asked her at the end, well, what are you doing? And she said, well, I'm head of safety for Trent Water. And there was somebody else there who was chief engineer for the National Rivers Authority. And it was just full of engineers or agricultural experts or statisticians. So they were very attracted to the sort of ministry that Bill had, and he's the right man to speak to us tonight about the creation mandate. And uh, they felt affirmed working in God's world, whatever it was, whatever job they were doing, uh, in whichever way they were serving Christ. So it's really appropriate and great that Bill can speak to us tonight. Now he's gonna speak, and then hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end for questions. So I'll, I'll hand over to you now. Bill. Thank you. Well, uh, Colin, thank you so much uh, for the invitation uh, to be with you tonight. This is a, a great uh, privilege, um, and I just want to say how much I give thanks uh, for the work of the Christian Institute. Uh, I know that your work can be extremely difficult and at sometimes uh, very challenging, uh, particularly in these days, but it is particularly in these days when the uh, work of the Christian Institute is so vital and so uh, important. So there are two readings this evening. Unsurprisingly, given the theme, we're uh, reading from Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 26 through to verse 3 of chapter 2. And then we will move to Matthew 28. Just the last few verses there. So Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work 
that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And turning to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, just reading from verse 18. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we come before you this evening thanking you for the privilege of doing so thanking you that though you are the creator of the universe, uh, you are not a distant God, uh, you are not remote from us as your people, uh, but uh, as the Lord Jesus promises here, uh, you are with us uh, to the end of the age. We thank you for this opportunity to gather as a body of your people this evening uh, to hear your word and to hear uh, this uh, teaching from your word. We do pray for your servant Bill as he uh, speaks to us. Uh, we pray that uh, you'll give him great clarity, uh, that you'll give uh, us the ears to hear and the hearts to understand and to put into practice uh, these doctrines uh, of your word. We thank you uh, for uh, his willingness to take the time out to prepare uh, and uh, to be here with us this evening. And we do pray uh, for your blessing upon our time together. Uh, we thank you uh, for uh, the fact that we have the privilege of being your people and of serving you in this world. And we pray that as a result of our time together this evening, we would be better equipped uh, to do so. And we pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for uh, his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much indeed. Tonight we're looking at the subject of the creation mandate. You notice that Colin has retained his place at the front of the room so that if I say anything wrong, he then rushes in from the side and rugby tackles me and the lecture comes to a premature uh, conclusion. But if we are seeking to honour the Lord in all of life, uh, then we turn to uh, Genesis chapters 1 to 2 to see the foundational uh, uh, principles of uh, the creator's purpose for humanity. And in specifically, we turn to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, which have ju just been read to us, which are often referred to as the creation mandate, or indeed over the last century or so, the cultural mandate. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The context, of course, is that the Lord has just completed his work of creation, climaxing in the creation of man and woman in his own image and likeness. And now he commissions them to rule over the world as his vice regents. They are to subdue it and exercise dominion over it. And they are to be fruitful and multiply so that their offspring fill the whole world. In other words, the commission of God is to extend the boundaries of Eden so that the whole world is populated, subdued, and ruled over according to his will. The whole earth is to be filled with those who are made in the image and the likeness of God, reflecting his glory, and returning all praise and honour and glory to him. It's a wonderful theme. It's a beautiful theme. It's picked up again, for example, in Psalm 8. Psalm 8 verse 4, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man 
that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. So what is involved in this godly dominion to which the Lord commissions us? Well, in the words of John Murray, the subduing of the earth must imply the expenditure of thought and skill and energy in bringing the earth and its resources under such control that they would be channeled to the promotion of certain ends which they were suited and designed to fulfil, but which would not be fulfilled apart from the exercise of man's design or labour. As we look back over human history, even fallen human history, we see the extraordinary accomplishments of the human race in so many spheres, whether it be in agriculture, in science, in engineering, in the arts, harnessing natural resources for our benefit. Uh, We think of the quality of life which we enjoy today, which is immeasurably better than those who lived in earlier centuries because of the advances that have been made. And yet, the creation mandate is under attack today. First of all, it's under attack from those outside the church, particularly the radical environmentalists, who regard the mandate not as a dream, but rather as a nightmare. They reflect on human history and see not just noble advances, but greed and the exploitation of the planet's resources. We share their concerns insofar as dominion has not been exercised according to godly principles for the glory of God. These environmentalists complain that many species of animals are now extinct or under threat. The planet is despoiled by the ravages of human exploitation and our future is blighted by pollution and climate change. For these deep greens... The fault lies with the cultural uh, cultural mandate, the idea of human dominion over the world. For them, human activity is a threat. In the words of David Attenborough, humanity is a plague on the earth. And the idea of us continuing to be fruitful and to multiply, now recently passing the world population of 8 billion in, uh, in recent days, is a menace to be confronted. The whole notion of human dominion is unpalatable. Surely, they say, we are ourselves just one species amongst many. Our goal and our ambition should be to live in harmony with our environment. There needs to be give as well as take. But there are also attacks on the creation mandate from within the church. Indeed, from within the Reformed Evangelical constituency. I'm thinking in particular of Reformed Two Kingdoms theology. The leading advocates would be, for example, Meredith Klein in an earlier generation. But today, the best-known advocate is David Van Drunen. His book, Living in God's Two Kingdoms, is a popular presentation of this position. It's also known as Escondido theology, as Van Drunen is based at Westminster Seminary West, And others there also take this line, including, for example, Michael Horton. This two kingdoms view has been promoted in Bible colleges in the UK, not London Seminary, I hasten to add, and is increasingly accepted in evangelical circles. And such two kingdoms critics would accuse me of being simplistic in my introduction about the application of the creation mandate today they would say I am mistaken because I have forgotten about or underestimated the impact of the fall. These critics point to the judgment of Genesis chapter 3. Yes, they say, the creation mandate commanded us to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, but now that fruitfulness is attended by struggle and difficulty. The marriage relationship is characterized by tension and conflict, 
and childbirth itself is painful. But even more fundamentally, the commission to exercise dominion is radically changed. Now, not only will daily work be painful and difficult, battling with thorns and thistles, but ultimately humanity faces the curse of death. Dust you were, and to dust you will return. In other words, rather than Adam subduing the dust, the dust would ultimately subdue him. And so we are told the only person who can fulfill the creation mandate is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the true Adam, who through his death and resurrection has attained to the highest place and now rules over all things in heaven and on earth. We are not still exercising dominion today. And so the question, very simply, is whether the creation mandate still applies today. I'm going to spend some time outlining the uh, Reformed Two Kingdoms position, and then I will seek to refute that position. And finally, I want to demonstrate positively God's continuing purpose for us through the creation mandate today. And so first of all, let's examine the two kingdoms view. And there are three headings. The first is very simply this. The creation mandate does not apply today. Uh, Meredith Klein describes the creation mandate as part of the covenant of works. And just to remind you of the traditional reformed view of the covenant of works, it is that through the obedient service of, of, of God in the garden, Adam and Eve would ultimately attain to the glory of the new heavens and the new earth. If they persevered faithfully through, through temptation, then ultimately the possibility of sin and mortality would be removed. It would be like the glory descending upon Solomon's temple. The glory of the Lord would descend upon Eden and humanity would enjoy the presence and the blessing of God irrevocably and eternally. But Adam, of course, succumbed to temptation. He was excluded from the garden and access to the tree of life. He fell short of the glory of God. And now it is only the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is able to take our place and fulfill the covenant of works and secure the promised glory on our behalf. And so Klein claims... The creation mandate, as part of the covenant of works, only applies strictly to Christ himself, not to us. We are not little Adams seeking to exercise dominion in the world. Listen to what Meredith Klein says. Quote, One cannot simply and strictly say that it is the cultural mandate that is being implemented in the process of common grace culture. It might be closer to the truth to say that the cultural mandate of the original covenant in Eden is being carried out in the program of salvation. Since the ultimate objective of that mandate, the Holy Kingdom Temple, will be the consummate achievement of Christ under the covenant of grace. So what about our cultural activity as Christian believers in the world today? Meredith Klein says this. All of their cultural activity in the sphere of the city of man, they are to dedicate to the glory of God, and though it is an expression of the reign of God in their lives, it is not a building of the kingdom of God as an institutional realm. For the common city of man is not the holy kingdom realm, nor does it ever become the holy city of God, whether gradually or suddenly. Rather, it must be removed in judgment to make way for the heavenly city as a new creation. Now, there's much in what Meredith Klein says with which we must agree. Of course, we are no longer living in the Garden of Eden. We cannot exercise dominion and subdue the earth in such a way as to establish the rule of God over all the earth so that we bring in the kingdom of God and attain to heavenly glory by our works. No, of course not. Only Christ can bring in the kingdom. Only Christ can transform this present world into the new creation. Only Christ can attain to the heavenly glory on our behalf. But Van Drunen doubles down on this emphasis. Quote, if Christ is the last Adam, 
then we are not new Adams. To understand our own cultural work as picking up and finishing Adam's original task is, however unwittingly, to compromise the sufficiency of Christ's work. Quote, through Christ's work, God not only forgives the sins of believers, but also reckons them as those who have perfectly completed the first Adam's task. So you notice that for Van Drunen, the stakes are very high indeed. He is saying that if we take the cultural mandate of Genesis chapter 1, and we say that that still applies to us as Christian believers today, to rule over, to subdue the, the world, to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, we are locating ourselves back in the covenant of works. We are claiming effectively that it is for us to build the new creation and to accomplish redemption by our own efforts. Indeed, Van Drunen goes so far as to say that you cannot hold the orthodox view of justification by faith alone if you believe that it is for us to fulfill the creation mandate today. There's nothing like polarizing the argument, is there? You know, because just, just in case we thought it was a minor theological difference, he tells us that actually we are rank heretics and we don't even believe in justification by faith alone if we don't agree with his position. So now the stakes really are high. But that's what he's saying. He's saying the creation mandate doesn't apply today. Secondly, he says, we are presently living in two kingdoms. Van Drunen maintains that at the fall, two kingdoms were established. There is first of all the kingdom of God, the seed of the woman, which was then established in God's covenant with Abraham. The ultimate fulfillment of the kingdom of God is Christ, who is the true seed of Abraham. And then the ultimate destination of this redemptive kingdom is the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. And so if you are a Christian believer here tonight, you are a member of God's kingdom, you live according to God's law, the Sermon on the Mount and the Ten Commandments, we love one another, there is a culture of grace and forgiveness amongst us, I trust. We are motivated by what God has done for us in salvation and our desire to please him. And our main concern in our Christian lives is to retain our godliness and not to be polluted by the immoral and ungodly influences of the world. Our first loyalty as Christian believers is to this redemptive kingdom and to the church whose role is preaching the gospel and administering the sacraments. That's the priority. But then there is also a second kingdom. There is the kingdom of this world, which is characterized by sin, the curse, death, and futility. The kingdom of this world operates under the sphere of common grace as defined by God's covenant with Noah. And the terms of the Noahic covenant are quite limited. It is simply a promise of God to preserve this present world order and to make provision for social order through the institution of the state which can exact capital punishment and other penalties to deter and punish violence and lawlessness. The common kingdom operates according to the principles of natural law. In other words, conscience and general revelation. You remember the redemptive kingdom, we're all obeying the Sermon on the Mount and the Ten Commandments, but in the common kingdom, out there in the world, it's governed by conscience and general revelation. And Van Drunen says there are actually only two institutions which are enshrined in the Noahic covenant, namely the family, because Noah repeats the element of the creation mandate, which speaks of being fruitful and multiplying, and the state, because there is an echo of the creation mandate to exercise dominion, but only over the animals and in exercising state authority over evildoers. The role of the state is simply the enforcement of justice so that we can live a peaceful and quiet life and keep the world going for a limited time before it is ultimately destroyed in final judgment. So the Noahic government operates to keep the world running in a reasonably manageable way while we get on with the really important business of the redemptive kingdom. When we look out upon the common kingdom, the kingdom of this world, we must not be so surprised 
when the world operates to very different moral values than we might desire. But, says Van Drunen, generally speaking, common grace culture operates according to values of honesty and integrity, which enable businesses to flourish and society to develop. So it's not so bad. If you're not a Christian, you just live in the common kingdom. If you are a Christian, you live in both the common kingdom and the redemptive kingdom. It's the redemptive kingdom which marks your identity as a citizen of the new creation. And we live in the present world, the common kingdom, only as strangers, aliens and sojourners waiting for our inheritance of the glory which is yet to come. So the creation mandate no longer applies. There are two kingdoms, a redemptive kingdom and a common kingdom. And thirdly, this present world will be completely destroyed in final judgment. The destination of this kingdom, of this, of this world, the common kingdom, is destruction. Recall Meredith Klein's closing sentence about this present world, quote, it must be removed in judgment to make way for the heavenly city as a new creation. In other words, the destination of the whole created order is the incinerator. It will all be destroyed utterly. It will be no more. All cultural activity is futile and in vain. And uh, Van Drunen takes the same line. Quote, the New Testament teaches that the natural order as it now exists will come to a radical end and the products of human culture will perish along with the natural order. Uh, he refers to 2 Peter chapter 3 and he speaks of this present world being set on fire, being dissolved and melting. He refers to the Noahic covenant and reminds us that God will only keep his promise to sustain the creation while earth remains. And he says time is running out. There is coming a day when this earth will be no more. All will be ash, vapour and destruction. It will all be gone. And the only point of continu continuity between this present world and the world to come will be our resurrection bodies. It reminds me very much of the rapture, of a sort of dispensationalism, really. You know, the idea that this world will be consumed in fire and completely incinerated, but we will be beamed up in our resurrection <coughs> bodies. We'll have to leave our clothes behind, of course, because they are products of the culture of this present world. But our resurrection bodies are the only thing that will survive. Van Drunen doesn't deny that there will be physicality in the new creation. But the point is that it will be a new creation. And the old creation will be no more. Everything in the realm of this present world is futile because nothing will survive. And the only thing that endures is our labours for the redemptive kingdom. Well, how do we respond to this, uh, this R2K, Reform Two Kingdoms, uh, theology? I, I've given a very, very brief overview for the sake of time. Obviously, doubtless if David Van Drunen was here in person, he would want to qualify, he would want to provide nuance to various elements of how I've described his teaching. Nevertheless, the R2K position is, in my view, seriously flawed. And it's been picked up and repeated and propagated in the UK in ways that are profoundly unhelpful. Because it has been taught in leading, leading Bible colleges, this represents the view of many of the younger generation of conservative evangelical leaders. And why is the Reformed Two Kingdom view so very unhelpful? Well, first of all, because it creates a radical distinct, distinction between the kingdom of God on the one hand and the so-called common kingdom on the other. Imagine the appeal of the preacher's sermon on a Sunday morning as he comes to the end of his oration. Come, he says, volunteer to work at the church in evangelistic outreach, in children's work, leading Bible studies, prayer meetings and the like. When you do that, you have the satisfaction of knowing that your labours will have eternal significance and are highly valued in the Lord's sight. Or on the other hand... You could pursue a demanding career in medicine or engineering or teaching or business or the law or manual labour 
And you can glorify God in such pursuits, especially, of course, if you take the opportunity for personal witness to your colleagues. But ultimately, whatever career you pursue in that realm of the common kingdom, it will be futile and in vain. And all of your labours will ultimately crumble into dust and vaporise on the last day. There's your inspiration to get you out of bed on a Monday morning and going into work, isn't it? You know, really, in enthusiasm. It sounds to me like a return to the sort of pre-Reformation divide between the spiritual and the secular. The only people who are doing the really important work are, you know, the monks and the priests and the nuns, the clerical orders... And then there's the common folks who are doing the menial and the lower task. Common labour is to be despised. So that's my first criticism of our uh, Reformed Two Kingdom theology. But secondly, it creates an inevitable indifference regarding our engagement with the world as salt and light. Because there is just the expectation that the common kingdom will operate at lower standards than the kingdom of God. Many evangelical leaders today express this uh, along the lines that we should not be surprised that we are seeing increasing levels of depravity in society. That's what the world is like. That's what we're to expect from the common kingdom. Now, according to Van Drunen, the world operates according to the principles of reason and natural law and needs no input of special revelation. In the realm of sexual morality, he claims that marriage is maintained in the Noahic covenant because of the repeated mandate to be fruitful and multiply. But is it? Is it really? The fact is that the context of such fruitfulness in the Noahic covenant is not specified. It could be fruitfulness within the context of mon monogamous marriage or polygamous marriage or a multiplicity of promiscuous relationships. If Van Drunen maintains that it is only Christ who is the true Adam who can fulfill the creation mandate, and that all that belongs in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 is in fact part of the covenant of works, then what about marriage as a creation ordinance? We could equally argue that Christ is the only true husband, and the church is the only true bride. So you could lose marriage as a basis uh, for marriage to continue in human society. Van Drunen also claims that in the common kingdom, principles of honesty and integrity still endure so that we can still do business together in society. Well, again, I fear that Van Drunen is speaking as a North American. He regards society as relatively civilised without recognising that his experience of society is civilised because it is a society which has been exposed to biblical and gospel influence for centuries. I wonder if he would have such a rosy view of his experience of society if he lived in other countries around the world. When God has mercy on a human society, he not only restrains sin by common grace but he also speaks by special revelation. Think Jonah in Nineveh. In the Western world, we see increasing depravity in the society around about us because that is the impact of a diminishing influence of special grace and special revelation. So I think the Reform Two Kingdom theology is seriously flawed. But I want to spend the remaining minutes that we have in a much more positive presentation of the continuing application of the creation mandate today. And again, there are three points. First of all, we work as image bearers. We work as image bearers. The creation mandate is a function of being made in the image and the likeness of God. That's very clear from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. He made us in his image and likeness, and then he commanded us to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion and subdue the world. In the words of Herman Bavinck in his Reformed Ethics, referring to these verses, he says, quote, To have dominion over the earth was not an end goal for human striving. No, it was a part of being made in God's image. Now, of course, the whole matter of being made in the image of God is a complex subject. We haven't got time to think of that in its complexity this evening. 
But nevertheless, dominion is a vital expression of our image bearing. And that's very plain in the context of Genesis. You remember in the first part of Genesis chapter 1, God has been uh, uh, has revealed himself as the absolute ruler over all creation. He exercises absolute sovereign authority. He speaks and the universe springs into existence. And then at the end of chapter 1, he makes us in his image and his likeness and he commands us to rule over and subdue the created order that he has summoned into existence. And so you can see, our dominion is a reflection of God's dominion. Whereas the Lord has acted supernaturally, summoning the world into existence, we now work within that realm, managing and superintending the creation according to the will of the Creator. That's the best response to the challenge of those who suggest that the creation mandate is the basis for the abuse and the destruction of the natural World. Well, it's very true, isn't it, that humankind has too often exploited the world in, in, in polluting uh, 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 and abusive ways. But if the commission was originally given by the creator himself, we can see that his purpose would never have been for the harm or destruction of his own creation. Rather, as those made in his image and likeness, we are called to rule according to his will and according to his Purposes. It's only sinful and ungodly rebellion which has wrought havoc. Uh, even in Genesis chapter 2, we see examples of how we rule and subdue, echoing God's creative activity. I was grateful for Colin's reference to uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, in his introduction. I think the number of engineers at Emmanuel had something rather more to do with the existence of Jaguar Land Rover and Aston, Aston Martin just up the road from Leamington Spa. But I'm glad that he identified engineering as the pinnacle of our expression of being made in the image and the likeness of God because we see that in the creation account. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 12, uh, it is remarked that uh, uh, in the entire land of Havilah there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. In other words, in the Garden of Eden, even before the fall, there were minerals. Well, how on earth were Adam and Eve and their progeny supposed to gain the benefit of those minerals? Well, they would have to uh, uh, set up a, a mining enterprise, wouldn't they? And then they'd have to set up furnaces to smelt and to mould and to put all of these minerals to productive use. You see, God did not say, oh, by the way, I've left some gold bars lying around which you might want to make use of. No, they needed to be dug out. They needed to be developed. And I trust that when you see a mine or an oil refinery or a factory, your heart sings within you as mine does as you rejoice that the world's resources are being utilised, at least in part, according to God's purpose. Or you see, for example, in Genesis chapter 2, the, uh, the origins of scientific endeavour, particularly the understanding, the ordering, the categorising of the world in which we live. So that just as God ordered the creation in chapter 1, separating the earth and the sky and the sea and the dry, dry ground... So now in Genesis chapter 2, made in the image and likeness of God, man names and categorizes the living creatures. Well, here we have the basis of the biological sciences and of all scientific endeavor. So as we go about the business of the creation mandate, we are reflecting God's activity. But I would go even further than that. As we fulfill the creation mandate, we are actually doing God's work. We are doing God's work. Listen to Psalm 104. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. Okay, here's a simple Sunday school question for you. Who feeds the animals? Answer, God. 
Who feeds us? Answer, God. Yes, right answer, children, well done. But there's always some miscreant at the back of the class who mischievously says, no, we get our food from Sainsbury's or Waitrose or Asda, depending on the cultural and uh, financial demographic of your Sunday school class. You see, actually, that miscreant at the back of the class is just as correct as the one who answered, it was God. Because in a sense, it is both. Remember what the psalmist says. God makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate. So actually, it's a cooperative effort. Imagine if the farmer lay in bed in the morning and said, praise God that God feeds the animals as he turns over and decides to devote himself to a few more hours of prayer, rather than going out and engaging in his hard work, you can see that he's uh, utterly failed to grasp the significance of the creation mandate. It's not just that God will do it. We are not hyper-Calvinist in that sense. God feeds us, but he feeds us through the cultural and creative activity of those made in his image and likeness who are doing his work, even unconverted people, you know, and perhaps most notably those who, you know, are working in Greg's factory just up the road from the Christian Institute, we are super abundantly grateful for their endeavours that we enjoy uh, day by day. There is a whole infrastructure of human activity involved in feeding people. And we could go on and we could list so many activities of the things that we need in everyday culture. It's our human responsibility. Again, Herman Bavinck, quote, even paradise was no land of plenty for the lazy. And in our fallen world, Bavinck then makes the connection with 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So God feeds us, but we are the means through which God works. And you can't just subdivide it rigidly. You can't say, well, God makes the grass grow, but the farmer harvests it and feeds it to the animals. No. God provides life and breath to the farmer. God sustains the sun and the stars and all of the physical processes which keep this world and this universe in existence. God is over all and in all and through all, but the farmer is nevertheless vitally instrumental in the whole exercise. And both Christians and non-Christians are fulfilling God's purpose through the creation mandate, expressing the love and the care of God for all humanity. And even while we grieve over the depravity of humanity, we marvel at the diligence, the creativity, the productivity, the compassion, and the care of others all around us who may or may not be Christians, all of whom are expressing the divine image and the fulfillment of the creation mandate. Yes, the creation mandate continues today. It is an expression of being made in the image and the likeness of God. In other words, as Francis Schaeffer says, the fall was ethical, not metaphysical. And it's this call to rule and subdue which is the context for the command to be fruitful and multiply. Why have children? Yes, good question. It's a question which is often asked by young parents soon after their first child has been born, they realise the reality and the demands of what they've let, they've, they've let themselves in for and they say to themselves, what on earth have we done and why did we imagine that it would be a good idea to have children? Well, of course, sadly, in a fallen world, not all cu- couples can have children. But for those of us who are married, to be fruitful, to have children is not only our privilege, but it is what God calls us to do, ultimately so that godly offspring will take up this commission of ruling and subduing the world in future generations. There is so much more to be said on that, but I just leave that there, and we can return to that in questions if you like. So we work as image bearers. Secondly, we work in hope. We work in hope. The idea that this world will be destroyed in final judgment is contrary to so much New Testament teaching. For example... The Lord Jesus Christ promises that the meek will inherit the earth. What exactly is he promising us? A pile of ash? The Apostle Paul speaks in Romans 8 of creation groaning as if in childbirth as it waits for the sons of God to be revealed. 
Creation longs to attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Are we to imagine that the groans are in fact futile because the creation will not survive the parousia to see our glorification? Similarly, in Colossians chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ is described as the Lord of all creation and the Saviour who died on the cross to reconcile all things to himself. Van Drunen refers to 2 Peter chapter 3, which is claimed to be teaching the destruction of all things at final judgment, but that's not the only way or even the best way of reading those verses. In those verses, if you read them carefully in context, you see the parallel with the flood, which did not destroy the world in that sense. But also, the particular word used in verse 10 has the sense of revealing or discovering. In other words, it's like the refiner's fire. It will not be destruction, it will be repristination. It will be radical transformation, because all of the effects of sin and the fall will be eradicated. All things will be made new so that the whole of creation will be holy to the Lord. But while all things will be made new, the Lord will make, n- not make comprehensively all new things, if you get the difference. To put it simply, on the last day, when the Lord Jesus Christ will return, and I emphasise return, where will he return to? if the world from which he ascended 2,000 years ago no longer exists. It seems to me that this is a biblical principle, that God's purpose after the fall is not to incinerate or to discard his creation, but rather to redeem it and to restore it. If creation was to be destroyed, that would be an admission that Satan had triumphed and God's creation purpose had been frustrated. But Notice God's covenant with Abraham, the promise of being fruitful, of being put in a land. Think Eden, you know, Canaan, Eden, a new Eden, of exercising dominion and driving out enemies. The whole point of the purpose of redemption is to recover and restore God's creation purpose. And in our experience, if we are Christians this evening, we can give our own testimony that God's purpose with us was not to destroy sinners but to redeem us, to restore us, to transform us, to make us new. And ultimately, that restoration will be consummated in our resurrection bodies. And just as the present world was subjected to the curse because of our sinful failure as lords of creation, so when we are redeemed and restored, the creation will also be restored too. That's what the creation is groaning for, the sons of God to be revealed. And when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, all of the effects of sin and death and the fall are removed and the cry goes up, the kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And on that day we look forward to entering into our inheritance. In the Reformed Two Kingdoms view, it is suggested that we are only aliens and sojourners in this present world in the sense that we don't really belong here. But if you look at the terminology of being a sojourner in the Old Testament, you find that it is applied to, for example, Abraham living in Canaan. Yes, Abraham was an alien and a sojourner, And he only owned a tiny piece of land. Yet nevertheless, he was the rightful heir of the land. And in due course, the existing wicked residents would be removed at the time of the conquest. And Abraham would inherit the land. Well, that, it seems to me, is a very close analogy to our situation as Christian believers. Dan Strange would say that we are not resident aliens, but alienated residents. In other words, we are aliens now in the sense that the kingdom of this world is dominated by the regime of the devil and rebellion against God. But the real aliens are those who do not recognize the rule of King Jesus and they will be removed in final judgment. If we are the true heirs of this world, then as we fulfill the creation mandate now according to the will of God, We are beginning a life of service of Christ that will continue for all eternity. 
It's interesting in the parables of Jesus that it's just assumed that there will be a level of continuity between service now and service in the new creation. So in Matthew chapter 25, the servant with five talents who earned five more receives the answer, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Or Luke chapter 19, well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. Now, I don't want to be crassly literal in trying to imagine what it will look like to take charge of cities in the new creation. Yes, it will be radically different from the here and now, but there will be continuity between the two. And so we bear testimony as believers, to the new creation in the present world. We as individual Christian believers and we as local churches are like embassies of the new creation, looking forward to entering into our new inheritance. We bear testimony as believers to the laws of God's kingdom and soon our obedience will be perfected and God's creation purposes will be restored as redeemed humanity takes its place in a position of dominion the Lord has called us Two, so we work as those who are made in the image of God, we work in hope, and thirdly and finally, we work as servants of Christ. Now we need to make very clear the central point of agreement with R2K theology. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who builds his kingdom. But the problem with the teaching of R2K is that it then tends to rush to the opposite extreme and suggest that there is no place for Christian believers to exercise Uh, dominion or to build the kingdom and yet when you read the new testament you read in revelation chapter 12 that it was believers who overcame by the word of their testimony or romans chapter 6 the god of peace will soon crush satan under your feet or i will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it in other words the church triumphs over the gates of hell And Paul makes another direct connection with the creation mandate. In Ephesians chapter 1, he describes the church as being his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And I want to focus in particular on the Great Commission. As the two were read together, the creation mandate and the Great Commission, you would have seen the parallel. First of all, notice the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Yes, But then notice that he commands his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. It's an echo of the creation mandate. But the difference now is that the world is not to be filled through procreation, but through the making of disciples in all nations through the preaching of the gospel. These disciples are to be baptized and taught to observe all the commands of Christ. So that whereas in the world today, humanity is seeking to exercise dominion in ways that may be ungodly or abusive or exploitative or at best unconscious of the lordship of Christ. Now as we make disciples, so the world is being filled with those who are actively and consciously serving the Lord Jesus Christ in every area of life according to his will. That was the original creation mandate for the world to be filled with image bearers who are exercising dominion and subduing evil according to the will of God in short our lives as Christian believers are a reflection of God's will we are called to have a transforming impact on every sphere of human society We want outstandingly godly teachers and medics and lawyers and engineers and garage mechanics and builders and carers and full-time mothers and so on and so forth. Believers who are equipped to serve the Lord in their vocations. Uh, I, I, I wish I had more time to develop that theme, but I don't. My time has gone. But ultimately, we look forward to the day when the transformation of this world will be complete. As Zechariah the prophet expresses it, 
On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the sacred bowls in front of the altar. In other words, Zechariah imagines a time in the future when the most holy place will expand to fill the whole earth. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And on that day, the ultimate goal of the creation mandate will be fulfilled because the whole creation will be united in praise and worship and adoration of our glorious God and our Redeemer. We mentioned earlier the depressing prospect of a preacher inviting us to go into work on Monday morning to pursue an utterly futile and hopeless vocation. Well, now compare with the preacher who addresses us like this. Go into work on Monday morning to fulfill the commission the Lord has given you to rule over and subdue his creation in which, whichever particular vocation he has called you to. You will do so in his presence, doing his work, in partnership with your creator and sustainer. You will do so in cooperation with other divine image bearers. The work may be difficult and frustrating, but nevertheless you can entrust your labours into the hands of the Lord. He sees your labours and can make them fruitful both in you and through you in this life and in the new creation. You may be ridiculed and opposed because of, our, uh, of your uh, diligent and godly labours. But there is coming a day when righteousness will be vindicated and evil will be condemned and Christ's kingdom will be established in glory. And on that last great day, you will be able to rejoice and to testify that as you worked for the glory of God, so indeed your labours were not in vain. Thank you, Colin. Thank you very much, Bill. Now, I'm sure there are going to be some questions. And just as you think about your questions, I'm going to get a quick question in. To some people here tonight, yes. the idea, they probably have a, I think it would be correct to say a Lutheran idea of the incinerator. Mm -hmm. we, some of us would be brought right, up okay. on, yes, on the yes, incinerator yes, yes. model, right? So yes. it's a, a pile of ashes after God's judgment. Mm -hmm. But the other idea you're advancing, which I guess would be more Calvin and mm -hmm. other reformers, mm -hmm. would be the idea of God refining uh, through, like gold yes. is refined, and yes. uh, there Precisely. may be other things in it. Precisely. All the ungodliness removed. It's, it's difficult to, to imagine, because the new creation will, of course, be radically different to this creation. I struggle, I don't know about you, but I struggle to imagine what a sinless Bill James will look like. Because as time goes on, I appreciate more and more the pervasive influence of sin in my life. So whether it be my thought life, my heart, my motivations, my temperament, my emotional life, my sense of humour, all of those things, I struggle to imagine what they would look like if I was completely sinless. Okay? But the sinless Bill James is ultimately the purpose to which God has called me and which ultimately, by the grace of God, I will be on that resurrection day. Okay. I think quite radically different from what you see before you uh, this evening. But nevertheless, continuity. Well, in the same way, it's quite difficult to imagine the world completely reprist repristinated with all of the effects of sin and evil and the fall and the curse removed. What will that look like geologically, for example? What will that look like biologically, botanically? All of those things. Well, I'm just, I'm just touching the surface. I think it's going to look quite different, but it's, it's going to be continuity. I think it's going to be recognisable. Uh, so, any, uh, is that sort of begun to answer the question? Yeah. Well, I guess we have many more questions after okay, hearing fine. that, but uh, yeah, that's good. Right, so let's have some questions. Are there, if, do raise your hand if you have. Yes, here. Yeah. Andrew will bring the microphone to you. Um, if the world is going to be um, redeemed and renewed rather than incinerated, um, have climate activists got it all wrong and can we relax a bit? 
Um, um, I, I think we can say what, whatever the debate might be about climate change, I, I think we can say that, uh, you know, obviously climate does change and we can debate to what extent that might be according to human activity. Certainly over the history of humanity we have been guilty to some extent of polluting and despoiling the planet. I think we should be rightly concerned about those things as Christians. We should be rightly concerned about matters of the natural environment and about ecology and, and, and all the rest of it because this is part of God's good creation. But yes, we groan and we look forward to the day when ultimately God will redeem all things. I wouldn't like us to be indifferent about environmental matters and just say, oh, it's all right because God's going to make it all right in the end anyway. I, th I think that would be negligent of us. Yeah. But will we destroy ourselves or will it be King Jesus who... Who, who wraps up history. Yes, it, it's, 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 very, it's very, very clear that the world will end when the Lord Jesus Christ appears and he will bring, he will bring this realm to an end. I, I think cer certainly this sort of ap apocalyptic vision that, you know, uh, humanity is only going to last perhaps another 10 years or something like this, you know, I, I think stretches the imagination somewhat. I should have said you were a chemical engineer. Y yes, yes, I, yes, I, well, I, yes, I, forgot, I still think of myself as an engineer, Colin, yeah. I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Are there any other? Um, Simon. Bill, thank you for that. Um, in your final section, you sped past some prepared remarks you were going to make about vocation. I'd love to know what you were going to say. Oh, some, some, fur, some further remarks about vocation that I was, I was skipping over somewhat. Um, oh, so, so, you, so, you're sort of, so you're sort of inviting me to finish my talk that I, would, that I, I sort of finished um, prema, prema, prematurely. Um, um, yeah, yeah, no, no, no I, I, was, I was just talk, talking, talking about the fact that... Um, as, as, we are, as, as we are working as um, servants of Christ, we are, uh, we are, as individual Christian believers and also as local church families, in a real sense working out the human life as God originally intended it to be. So in other words, according to the pattern of God's law, God's Ten Commandments and so on and so forth. So, so in other words... Uh, there is only one law. I, I don't like this idea of Van Drunen, that there are two standards in society, that the church keeps the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, that the common kingdom, it's just sort of nat natural law and, and common grace. I think that even the precepts of the S Sermon on the Mount, which were given explicitly to Jesus' disciples, even the precepts of the Apostle Paul that were given, say, specifically to the Ephesian church within their local church membership, have much general and broader, more, broader application to common society. So, for example, the Lord Jesus Christ says to his disciples, do not be like the Gentiles who lord it over, you know, like, like masters, who, who lord it over the people for whom they are responsible. Rather, he commends them the pattern of servant leadership, and he commends them his, his own example, that he has come not to be served, but to serve. Okay. Now, that, that is a command given explicitly to Christian disciples for use within the Christian church. But it's very interesting that in recent decades, uh, uh, leading uh, uh, authorities in the business world have taken up that model of servant leadership and say, yes, that is the best model of management, full stop, in the world. They're not necessarily making a, a reference to Christian values explicitly. They're, they're not necessarily Christian believers. But they're saying that actually that's the best way of doing things. And I'm sitting here thinking, surprise, surprise. Because actually if that's, if that's God's original creation activity, that's why he impresses those values on us as believers and as a church. And we stand before the world and we testify, this is the best way to live, chaps. Okay? So it's a glorious testimony, and we are then a light to the nations. That was what I was more or less going to say. So thank you, uh, thank you for giving me permission to finish my lecture. That was great. Thank you. Yes. Um, we'll have, uh, is that both two members of the staff here? We've got John, who's near his microphone with Nathan, and then we'll have Kieran. Thank you for that, Bill. It was, it was a, a 
it was so refreshing to hear what you said. Uh, my question is, when we're praying, um, your will be done on earth as yes. it is in heaven, Yes. what are we praying for? Are we praying for the growth of the church? Are we praying for God's moral law to be obeyed widely in society? Or is it even bigger than that, that we're actually praying for God's will to be done in the exercise of the creation mandate? Uh, I would say yes to all of those three things. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, would, I, would, I would be inclined to think that you're right on, right on all of those counts. So, so ultimately, in a sense, insofar as we are praying for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are aspiring, in a sense, to the coming of God's kingdom and the consummation when, in a sense, we will perfectly reflect his will and his purposes and obey him perfectly without sin. But I think even within the interim, in our experience in the present world, we are praying that increasingly, both within the church, but I, I generally think of the wider world when I pray that prayer, so that I pray for kings and rulers and governments and authorities, and I pray for the people who live in society around me who have responsibilities of all sorts, and I pray that they would be constrained by common grace and so on and so forth, well, by, by their conversion, but also by common grace, to increasingly reflect the will of God in all that they do and the decisions that they make. Yes. Thanks, Bill. I, w I wonder if you could uh, say a little bit about Van Drunen's theology of judgment insofar as <clears throat> it seems to me that he must struggle to, um, to apply uh, a consistent view of judgment to a, a, what did you call it, the common world or uh, where okay. the moral law doesn't doesn't apply. So does he hinge everything on a response to hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the moral law doesn't have any part to play in God's judgment? How does, how does he deal with that? I'm a, I'm a bit confused. I, I think that's a very interesting question. I'm not sure that I can give a, a complete answer to that. He, he, is, he is a Westminster Standards man. That leaves me somewhat scratching my head from time to time when I read Dan Van Drunen because I wonder how he fits all this together in his head. Because if you're a Westminster Standards man, then surely you're going to say, well, you know, the law of God applies universally and that is the standard by which judgment will be carried out. Um, so I, I, that's not clear to me. That's, that's not clear to me. But I assume that he has an orthodox view that ultimately judgment will be carried out according to the law of God and that humanity, uh, unbelieving humanity is found to be guilty on the day of judgment insofar as they knew that they were breaking the law of God, a.k.a. Romans 2, uh, you know, in their consciences accused them, um, and so on and so forth. I, 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 I assume that it would be along those lines, but I don't know, so, yes. Yes. Yeah. Anything specifically to be made of the creation mandate being a triune God creation mandate. I'm thinking of something that Sinclair Ferguson had said, that everything was good but not everything was garden. And in that garden there was a relationship. Yes. And in a way it was a father relationship. Yes. So is there anything to be made of that in the creation mandate, in the spreading of the garden, uh, well, outwards. I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, there is so much more that could have been said on, on, on so, so many levels. Y yes, it is definitely relational. Uh, you know, we could ask the question, is that the fact that when God created man in his image and likeness, he created a plurality of persons, name, namely male and female, is that an echo of Trinitarian relationships question mark okay so is there an echo of relationship there certainly we're talking about relationship between the male adam and eve husband and wife and so on and so forth but i think we're talking about a greater multiplicity of relationships between human beings because uh, the exercise of the creation mandate is a cooperative exercise it's not something that you and i can can do individually or personally 
uh, uh, you know, we, we need to be married so that we can be fruitful and multiply, and then we need lots and lots of other people with different gifts and capacities and abilities so that we can get this task done together. So I think relationships is, is integral to it, and as we progress with the creation mandate, we're doing that out of love for God and love for our neighbour. So there's more levels of relationship there. I, I think, you know, that, that's a great theme. Yeah. Uh, Clifford, and then over here. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, yep. verse 16, yes. but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, yes. and the heavenly bodies will be burnt up and dissolved, yes. and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Do you take that precisely. as a cleansing fire? Yeah, precisely, precisely. And, and, and this is very, and, you know, if, if, if we get into the exegesis of these verses in Second Peter 3, we'll be here all night. But this, this, this thing about, you know, the, 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 the heavenly bodies being swept away, you get similar language in the prophecy of Isaiah, for example, referring to judgment on the nations. So in other words, to what extent is this picture language? But I, I absolutely pick up on that point of the works being exposed. Yes, absolutely. It's a purification and a condemnation of the evil that is, that is evident in the, in the world. Yeah. 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 Just over here, Nathan. If Van Drunen is indeed wrong and we... Uh, well, and does that mean that we are little Adams? And if we're not little Adams, how do you interpret that theological idea within the framework presented this evening? Uh, okay, I, I, I think it would be fair to say that we are not little Adams in the sense that we are not, not in the Garden of Eden, we are not in the covenant of works, and we are certainly not sinless. So in other words, we are definitely children of uh, Adam and not, 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 in, not in a good way uh, because actually we're now living in the environment of death and of judgment and of condemnation and we have sinful nature and all of that. So in that sense we are not little Adams but I come back to what Francis Schaeffer says that the fall is ethical not uh, metaphysical. Uh, or, yeah, yes. Um, and, and so ultimately we are still human beings made in the image and the likeness of God. You see that picked up, for example, in Genesis chapter 9. That's the prohibition against murder because we must not kill someone who's made in the image and the likeness of God. And that's true post-fall. So, okay, so we're not exactly the same as Adam, but there is a continuity. What, yeah. is, what does metaphysics mean? Um, okay, so... so uh, me, uh, so, so if, if you, if you, if, 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 if no, it wasn't metaphysics. I actually used the wrong word. I should have used ontologically, didn't I? Yeah. So, 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 so the fall was ethical, not ontological. So, in other words, it didn't change absolutely who we are. That, yeah, sorry. Right, so That's we're right. Still yeah. in our nature of being. Yes. 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 Okay. So we're still human beings. After exactly. Fall, precisely. Fallen. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Precisely. So I had Americans say to me, "You'd, you'd study this. God doesn't make junk and." God doesn't junk what he has made. Yes, precisely. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's good. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm not quite certain if my question is, is relevant to the creation mandate as such, but um, you, you do refer to the environmental aspect of things. And can you explain the difference between God's six days and the, cre um, and the, uh, the evolutionists' 500 million years. Is uh, it relevant to your subject? Uh, yeah, I probably couldn't explain the difference in two minutes, uh, on, uh, on, uh, only that I don't accept the, uh, the sort of theistic evolution position, and I, I, don't, I, I don't think you can square it with the scriptural account. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah. Do, you, do you want me to go further than that? Right. Don't say a bit more if we want. We've got no, I'm fine. One yeah. or two minutes. No, no. no. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to tease out what the question was about. I, but, yeah. Right. Well, I, I thank you. Thank you very much, right. Bill, thank you, for Colin. everything you said. And um, I think many of us really want to mull over. There's been lots of lectures. In fact, every lecture, I really wanted to mull over so much that has been said.